Good evening, everyone. If anyone has public comment, please um, bring it to the board secretary at this time. Thank you.
Anybody ready? Good evening. I would like to call to order the school board and receiver business meeting for March 21st, 2022. I am Dr. Lori Susky, the court appointed receiver. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, I'd like to announce that the school board and receiver met in executive session prior to the school board meeting at 5 o'clock p.m. this evening to discuss personnel and student matters. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Mr. Thompson. Ms. Copeland, Ms. Radcliffe, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Thompson Leader, Ms. Robinson, here, Mr. Roy, here, Mr. Williams, here, Mr. Carter, here, Dr. Lori Susky, here. Thank you, Madam Secretary. At this point on the agenda, we have the approval of the board minutes from the February 22nd board meeting. They are attached to the agenda and I approve the minutes as presented. Additionally, we have the agenda for this evening's meeting, March 21st, 2022, 
and I approve the agenda as presented. At this time, I would turn it over to Superintendent Terman for recognitions. Thank you, Dr. Susky. Uh, we have two recognitions for this evening. The first is going to be the Harris, Harrisburg School District Music Educators, uh, Music in the Schools Month. The Harrisburg School District is proud to celebrate National Music, National Music in Our Schools Month and the significant influence music education has on school-aged children. We extend thanks and appreciation to our music teachers for all they do to make music come alive in our schools and the lives of our students. At this time, we will show you a very quick video. Hi, I'm Miss Tolly. I'm a music educator at Camp Curtin Academy. Why music is important to me and why I feel like our students need this is because music is everywhere in life. Whether we're at the grocery store, a sporting event, in the car, in the shower, singing, we have music everywhere around us. And music is the perfect way to express everything. One of my friends gave me a graduation card, that a quote that stuck with me for 30 plus years. It was from a composer named Robert Schumann that says, music is to me the perfect expression of the soul. And I've stuck with that quote for over 30 years because no matter what mood we're in, no matter what emotions we're feeling and what we're doing, there is a way that music can be involved. And that's why I want these children in, in the Camp Curtin to understand that music is a part of life every day for whatever emotion, no matter what job we're in, it can be the, a healer, it can be an escape, it can be calming, it's just there for us to enjoy and just to be in the world and hear all the different music that is in the world is amazing. And no matter what language we speak, music is a language that all of us can understand. So that's why I feel like music is important for all of us. So as we celebrate music in school this month, I like the following staff members, if you're in attendance, to please come up to be recognized. Shannon Tolley from Camp Curtin, Mr. Kwong from Melrose, and also Mrs. Robbins from Foos. These are some of our fine music educators in the Harrisburg School District. I myself had an opportunity to visit a couple classrooms last week. Uh, actually got a chance to play the recorder with Mrs. Robbins' third grade class. Uh, we played Hot Cross Buns. So I will definitely be playing that at the concert in the spring, but we just wanted to recognize you and thank you for all your efforts and what you do for our students. Thank you. Next, we would like to recognize Ben Franklin and Cougar Academy and the students and staff there. The Harrisburg School District is excited to announce that a team of fourth grade students from Ben Franklin School won first place and a seventh grade team of students from Cougar Academy won fourth place at the 2022 Capital Area Intermediate Unit Regionals K-Next STEM Design Challenge. Congratulations to our STEM teachers, Ms. Melanie Taylor and Ms. Cheryl Capazzoli and our students. Best wishes for Ben Franklin. And we actually have someone, uh, the teacher from Ben Franklin is gonna come up and share her experience. Yep. I'm really excited to Kyrie Davis, Amarion Brody, and Olivia Green competed to rep they'll be representing IU15. They had a real world problem. They had to design a transportation system that would make the world a cleaner and healthier place, or they could have chosen to go um, redesigning like bikes, cars, and trucks. They came up with the idea during the pandemic. We all know that we had package problems with shipping packages and there weren't enough trucks. And they decided even if there were enough trucks, there's a lot of pollution. So they designed a package pipeline that would be built along highways and would shoot the packages from ports to warehouses. So we're getting ready for the state competition coming up in May. It was a wonderful experience for them because they went through the whole design process. They had to do blueprinting and they had to present their um, problem and how they solved it. So now we're off to the state competition. So. Thank, you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor, and congratulations and good luck on your next competition. Dr. Susky, that ends the recognitions for this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to our staff and students. Moving on to our presentations this evening, I'm going to call upon Mr. Selmer to introduce our first presenter, who I believe is on Zoom, correct? And out of a real board meeting for two years, I apologize, forgot how to turn on the mic. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm, I'm pleased to have Mr. CJ McConnell uh, with us this evening virtually uh, to discuss uh, initiative we've been looking at regarding additional air purification for our classroom spaces here in the Harrisburg School District. And uh, Mr. Uh, McConnell is going to have a very informative presentation as the administration continues to work uh, on this initiative. Uh, moving into the coming years, and uh, this would be an ESSER-funded uh, initiative, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Connor. Thank you so much, Mr. Selmer, and I, I hope you all can hear me. I, want, I wanted to go ahead and thank um, Superintendent Terman, Board President Carter, the rest of the board for allowing me to present, as well as the Harrisburg community as a whole, so thank you so much. Um, really quickly, I'm going to pull up my screen and just really jump into it for you guys. Um, give me one second. Can you all see my screen okay, I hope? Yes? Okay, well, re really quickly, uh, th thank you for allowing us to join. Um, just brief background, my name is CJ McConnell. I am the president of Protect Ed. Um, I am the president, by no means the brains behind the operation. We, we do have s several physicians on staff. One's a professor at Cornell. She's a cardiologist and an epidemiologist, as well as um, several other physicians and um, educational staff to advise us on our products. Um, very briefly, I'm really excited to introduce our NanoStrike technology. Um, we've been able to talk with the district for several months. This technology is over, has been used for over a decade in the medical space. Some of our customers that we like to tout are the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, and we have great medical references. Um, also important to note that we've been serving some of the most medically fragile patients on earth for over a decade. So we're really excited to bring this to the Harrisburg community and to the, to the um, board for reveal. Very briefly, as we talk about air quality, air quality really falls into one of two buckets. The first bucket is, is something that most people are pretty familiar with at this stage, which is called the trap bucket. They would include um, technologies like HEPA filtration or really even MERV filtration upgrades. Um, our epidemiologist has outlined a couple problems and challenges that she has with trap technologies. The first one being um, the, the microbes that we're trying to catch, whether it's COVID or any other of the viruses or some of the bacteria that, that, are, that, are in our, that are in our buildings, every building in the United States, is, is that the, the pathogens are so small that no filter on earth can reliably catch these. So that's, that's one of the first challenges. The second challenge is during the pandemic, we were able to isolate some of the super spreaders within schools, and there were people like principals or the superintendent or counselors or um, custodial staff. Um, fil filters are a problem in classrooms because very often you have to change those filters, and those custodi custodial staff members are, are um, put, put in jeopardy because they're actually changing uh, something that carries a significant bio burden. So that's the second problem. And then the third problem is more of a practical one. As we move through the pandemic and out of it, um, we wanna make upgrades that are meaningful for our schools. Some, one of the problems though is um, with, with filters is it, 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 it presents a, a pretty large strain on an operating budget as you move out of the pandemic and, and move many years into the future. What we're gonna outline is what's called an inactivate or a kill technology. Examples of that are chemicals. Unfortunately, chemicals have no positive effect on air quality, extreme heat, UV. Um, I, I'm sure you guys have seen some of the challenges that some districts around the country are having with UV. Um, but what we're gonna review is our truly patented nano strike technology, um, which is unique to our company. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys is um, what, what's really different about our technology. Our Protect 900W, first and foremost, we think this is by far the most important thing for districts. Um, districts are getting bombarded with options, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of clinical data that supports some of the options that are being presented to districts. 
We are fortunate enough to have over 60 clinical studies. Um, all of these studies were done by medical physicians. Uh, what's cool is our studies span everything from airborne viruses to bacteria to allergens, your allergens, molds and spores, and then your odors and VOCs. What's really unique about our studies is half of them were done in FDA registered lab chambers. Um, lab chambers are great, but they do not give us a good um, picture of what the real world is like because we can control any variable. So what I think is really unique about our studies is half of them are done in labs the other half are, were done in live occupied spaces and all by physicians and all done independently. So we have provided a lot of this information to the administrators of the district and we, we have copious amounts of data to support um, any of the claims that we make. Um, before I get into how the technology works, I wanna give you guys all a visual of what this technology looks like. It's, so this device is 14 inches by 14 inches. It's four inches deep and it weighs 10 pounds. So it's a, a pretty small footprint, roughly the size of a large textbook. Um, all that the district does is installs this on the wall of one of their classrooms with two screws. We actually recommend that you hang these at six feet. I do have a study later in the presentation to point as to why. But um, the short answer is six feet is what's known as the breathing zone. That's where most of our pathogens like to hang out. So we want to have the maximum impact on that space. Also, we only pull three amps. You do not need a dedicated circuit for our technology. There is no maintenance required and there's absolutely no replacement parts. So our device is one, a one-time capital investment. Um, and from that point forward, you will never change a filter. You'll never change a bulb. The only thing that needs to be done is there's a lint screen on the top of the device, just like you would have in your dryer that needs to be cleaned once per month. We give you two per device. Our recommendation is you just, you go ahead and you just take all the clean ones, switch them out with the dirty ones, and it's a very quick process. If you're ever to break or lose one of those, it is not a cost. We replace them for free. Um, also, our device at full power only pulls 14 watts, roughly a tenth of the energy of your average purification system. We also come with a seven-year, 100% replacement warranty. So you will never have to make repairs to this device. If, if the light on the side of it goes off, you send it back to us. We give you a replacement device in 48 hours. Um, lastly, a lot of districts have asked me, well, what, do you, what happens after seven years? Well, our device has been used in the medical sector and we do measure our fail rates. We can prove a 0.3% fail rate of all devices in the field over 10 years and older. So they, they last for a long time. And then lastly, really important for education, our device only, pull, only emits 40 decibels. Um, from six feet away, we're only 20 decibels. So just to give you guys an idea, 40 decibels is roughly the sound of a quiet library. 20 decibels is roughly the sound of a wet whisper. So this is not gonna interfere any, with any um, children's instruction or learning. And we think that's a really important facet. Really quickly, I just wanted to outline what are we doing from the highest level possible. So we are actually destroying a pathogen from the DNA or subatomic level. What does that do? It prevents a human host from being infected and it prevents spores and bacteria from colonizing and reproducing. The way we're doing this is a process called osmotic pressure. We're putting so much pressure on a pathogen that it actually bursts from the DNA level. And so that's really important. A lot of people, when I show them this, they're like, well, what, the, the, the immediate concern is, well, what are you emitting into the air? This sounds like a pretty intense process. Well, it, it isn't. So we have all the UL certifications and the California Air Resource Board rating to show that we are emitting no ozone, no harmful chemicals in the air. And again, we have that long track record in the medical field. Um, really briefly, I wanted to outline some of the pathogens that are common in schools that we're going to have an impact with. Obviously, it being an ESSER spend, it needs to obviously have a focus on COVID. We do have studies against SARS-CoV-2, the parent of COVID-19 at 99.99% effectiveness, as well as these other pathogens that we're going to be worried about going into the future. Influenza A, 99.9% effective. Staph, MRSA, highly, highly effective. Um, and then also you can see at the bottom, one of the larger school districts in the country is buying this as a, a means of fighting mold. We will never replace remediation from an active leak, but what we can do is prevent that mold from spreading to other parts of the building and we can severely mitigate symptoms felt amongst students in class. Um, briefly gonna touch on these studies and we're, we're, we're kind of getting there. Um, so this is a study we did in, in a school district in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, they wanted to redact their name. 
They're having some mold issues in their administrative buildings. And we were able to demonstrate a 90% reduction in airborne mold counts within um, 40 hours of installing the device. What I think is really interesting about this study is after the study concluded, we removed our device from the wall. Within 72 to 96 hours, all those mold spores went to their normal levels. So very highly effective. And then the last study, I just wanted to give you an overview of, um, again, for the long-standing positive effects of our device in your environment. This is a study done by the National Health Society in the UK which they also take a, um, they, 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 they have a role of taking care of their equivalent of the VA hospitals over there. And our device hung at six feet in a patient room, we were able to demonstrate not only disinfecting the air, but a 68% reduction in surface level bacterial counts. Now, obviously we aren't pulling things off of surfaces. It just goes to show and points out what we've learned during the course of the pandemic is a, a considerable portion of our surface problem is actually an air problem that's gone untreated. So really, really, really strong data there. Our device is $2,344 per unit. It is medical grade, but again, the devil's in the details with this stuff. Um, we, again, the cost savings come in terms of you're never changing a filter. And then also we're pulling the 10th of the, the amount of energy as that your typical device. And then lastly, before I open up for questions, I just think it's really important, obviously, um, this is a hospital grade technology we have moved into the school space. So our references are endless. We've outlined a lot of those to the administration, but as you can see in Pennsylvania, Big Spring did a full installation, Fort Stockton, Sweeney, um, Russell County Schools in Kentucky, Kamal ISD in Texas, the list is, is really endless. And I think that's really important when making an informed decision. So with that, I can open it up to any um, questions or, or thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. We appreciate the uh, presentation. Just a couple uh, comments uh, that I'd like to make publicly. Uh, the PowerPoint that CJ just presented will be available after the meeting and will be attached to board docs under presentation. So if you wanna go and take a look at that, I encourage you to do so. The nano strike technology that uh, he reviewed tonight uh, is a sole source type of technology, which is an important distinction when we're looking at our procurement uh, methods if we move forward with this project. Uh, the next thing is when the pandemic started, uh, we, as the board knows and the community, we purchased a number of different uh, Bissell units for classrooms. Uh, we had to react quickly. And, and what we're doing here is really pivoting to a more longer term solution that's not only applies to COVID, uh, but can apply to other air quality components in a classroom for the long term. And that's what we see this. If we move forward, this is a long term investment in the air quality within every classroom space and office space in the Harrisburg School District. We do have two units that are in the field house. We've had them installed for a, a number of weeks. So if you're in the field house area, when you walk in the doors, there's one to your right and, and one to your left. Uh, and, and they are working well and, and they are operating at, at the field house. Uh, the last piece is there is a local district that has, has gone this route, and that's Big Spring. Uh, so we've been in contact uh, with their administration as well as their former superintendent. Uh, so we've been researching this for a number of months because we've been looking for an option to take us to a different level beyond what we did at the beginning of COVID. And we truly believe uh, with the ESSER funding, this is a one-time opportunity also, given the, the capital challenges that we face as a school district long term as we work uh, starting this summer to enhance HVAC systems, that's a long term proposition. So this can be a great addition for our students and our staff within each of the classrooms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Selmer and Mr. McConnell. At this time, Mr. Terman, our superintendent and Dr. Susan Sneath, chief, uh, chief academic officer will be presenting on Future Ready PA Index from 2021. And as Dr. Sneath uh, makes her way to the podium, uh, the Future Ready Index was uh, posted within uh, this current month. Uh, so she's gonna have an opportunity to speak from the Keystone, uh, PSSA, the L Data graduation, kind of give everybody a comparison in terms of where we are currently, and where we are before the pandemic, so everybody can see the comparison. Dr. Sneath. Hello, 
also some of the other data sources that we use to guide our instructional decision making. So before we go into that, I think it's really important to highlight the impact of COVID-19 on the Harrisburg School District in regards to assessment. In COVID-19 had a tremendous impact on every school district across the country. We will discuss the specific impact of COVID-19 on the Harrisburg School District community beginning on March 12, 2020 throughout the 2021 school year. In the, in the 2021 school year, um, Harrisburg School District remained remote. Um, we did so because this, the guidelines and the safety guidelines told us that that was in the best interest of our students. We had to pivot really quickly. Our teachers had an intensive week of professional development and did amazing in that year to try to hone in their skills, to teach all students remotely. Um, a couple weeks into the school year, many of you might remember that we changed to a modified synchronous online schedule. That reduced the number of minutes that students were online directly face-to-face -face with teachers because we felt that, especially for our youngest learners, that it was a really long time for them to be sitting in front of a screen. So we made a combination of synchronous and asynchronous instruction um, for our students. And that, that change happened around in the middle of September of last year. That is the schedule that we used throughout the year last year. Um, it, on April 6, 2021, we invited our K-2 students to come back to in-person learning. We also invited our K-12 low incident special education students to also come back for in-person learning. Um, <clears throat> And I'll go into this later, but about 50% of those two groups of families made the decision to return their students to in-person learning. PDE announced um, that statewide spring assessment parameters were changed for the 2021 testing windows in, the, uh, in about February. That's when we learned of that. And that's really interesting because typically we have sp a spring um, assessment window but PDE did something by extending the spring testing window to go throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, we, we weighed the pros and cons of this and we made the decision that we wanted to sweep our students in and test them all in the spring so that we did not lose instructional time when we came back in person, the hope was at that time, in person for the beginning of the 21-22 school year. <clears throat> So the data, the data, um, the data is from the 2021 school year, and we swept in all PSSA students and Keystone students into the school district, some for the first time of in-person learning in over a year. I want to read this quote though from PDE before I go into what those, those results yielded. PDE cautions school districts. Historically, standardized assessment results have been an important part of understanding school performance and our work to close achievement and opportunity gaps. But this year's results are anything but standard. We recognize that the global COVID-19 pandemic brought tremendous challenges to the, to the school year, impacting students, teachers, and staff alike. As we work to protect the public health, health and safety of everyone in our classrooms, said PDE Deputy, Deputy Secretary for Elementary and Secondary Education, Sherry Smith. As Pennsylvania reports this federally required data, it urges caution in interpreting results given the unique learning conditions over the past few years. I wanted to start with that because I think that is very important when I go into some of the explanation in a little bit. Our district decided to, um, we decided to sweep our students in and what I mean by that is we came up with a testing plan where we were bringing in large groups of students, but not all students, um, one group at a time. So 
what we did was during the week of April 6th, you, re you remember, we brought our K-2 and K-12 low incidence special education students back in for in-person learning. Two weeks later, we brought our third and fourth graders in for PSSA testing. Two weeks after that, we brought our fifth through eighth grade students in for PSSA testing. And then the week of May 19th, we brought our high school students in for Keystone testing. We did this very intentionally because we were trying to um, coordinate not just the testing, which was so important, but the operations of the school district, including transportation, food service, all of these operations that had not been practiced and in place for over a year. So to give you, so to give you some um, comparative data, the last year that Harrisburg School District had a typical year of, an, of traditional school with in-person learning is the 18-19 school, school year. So what I did here on this chart was I compared the PSSA data for ELA for students in grades three through eight to the 2018-2019 school year compared to how they performed in the 2021 school year post-COVID. Um, I'm going to just read the numbers really quickly because I, I don't know if you can see those numbers, but third grade in 1819, 15.5% of students were proficient or advanced. 2021, that number went down to 7.7%. Now, please note on the right side, I'm, I'm highlighting the number of students that participated in this sweep in for, um, for our testing in the spring of last year. 77.28% of our students came in in third grade to do the testing. In fourth grade, 19, 2019, 20.5, 2021, 12% proficient and advanced. 80% of the students came in for assessment. Fifth grade, 16.8% proficient and advanced. That went down to 6.7% proficient and advanced and about 66 percent of students came in for assessment. Sixth grade, 23.1 in 2019, went down to 13.8 in 21, 73% of students came in. Seventh grade, 22% um, were proficient in the 18-19 school year and 16.5% proficient in the 2020, 2021 school year with about 70% of students coming in. Eighth grade, 23.9, went down to 22.5, with about 73% of our students coming in. This is a perfect example of learning loss. This is what we've been told to expect. In some cases, the loss is more than we hoped. In some cases, our students fared better than we thought. Um, but the participation rates skew this data. We didn't have 100% of our students, therefore, we're going to take this data along with other data and just consider it for future planning and instructional planning. I think it's best that I don't read all the numbers, but I will highlight um, for PSSA pre and post COVID mathematics. Um, again, we saw something similar, uh, um, a reduction in third grade, but in fourth grade, actually, students did, there was um, a couple percent of students did better in the 2021 school year. Mr. Can you go back? Can you go back? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but for the most part, what we saw was a decline. We saw about a 50% decline overall in the advanced proficient performance in 1819 compared to 2021 of the students who took the assessments. The overall number of students pretty much that came in across the board is about 70% of our students. Science, we saw um, a, a large reduction, about a 50% reduction in the area in the fourth graders. Um, they went from 41% proficient to 28% proficient in 2021. Um, but we saw a milder reduction in eighth grade where 21% of our students were proficient in 1819 and 19% were proficient in 2021.
I also want to highlight the, the four-year cohort graduation rates, since this is part of our, um, our recovery goals. And I wanted to make note of the 2018-19 four-year cohort graduation rates compared to 2021. Um, in the 18-19 school year, we did not have enough students to make a cohort that requires 20 graduating seniors. So Cougar's graduation rate in 2021 was 87%. John Harris's graduation rate went from 55.9 in 18-19 to 61% of students graduated in 2021. SciTechs went from 97.4% graduation rate to 95.7% graduation rate in 2021. So to explain keystones is a little trickier. I'm gonna do my best to um, make it very clear and understandable. Keystone exams for high school students are course specific assessments. Students that are in algebra, biology, and literature are required to take a keystone. Due to the pandemic in the 1920 school year, there was no testing. Therefore, PDE made the determination that they would give something called a COVID proficient to all students who pass the classes in algebra, literature, and biology. That's important to understand. Despite the waivers, keystones were offered to any student that missed their keystone in 2020 and any student who was eligible in 2021 during the spring keystone window in 2021. So we swept keystone students in. When we saw the future ready, um, when we saw the future ready reports a couple weeks ago, it's a little bit confusing because when future ready reports keystone success, they're referring to students in 11th grade only. So students can take keystones multiple times, but they report in future ready on the 11th graders and that the best score that they earned in ninth, 10th and 11th grade. So I hope that makes some sense. Future Ready reports keystone scores on students in grade 11. A student may take a keystone multiple times, uh, grade nine through 11, but only the best score is used for Future Ready when the student is in grade 11. Students from the 1920 school year were not required to take this keystone. If a student passed the class, he or she received something called the COVID proficient. Many of our high school students were very anxious to come back to in-person school, making it appealing for students to come in, take the assessments, whether they needed it or not. So the Future Ready publication came out um, just a few weeks ago. And the achievement data for the Keystone Algebra is as follows. So in at Cougar, the 11th graders 2.8% were proficient in algebra compared to the state average of 37.3%. John Harris, 20% of students, 11th graders, were um, proficient in algebra with the state average 37.3. And at SciTech, 53.7% of our students were proficient with the state average at 37.3. In biology, Cougar uh, students, 23.7% of students were proficient um, or advanced, the PA state average 63.7. John Harris, 5.9% of students, 63.7. And SciTech had an insufficient sample. In other words, um, less than 20 11th graders who took the bio exam. So we don't have a report there. And in literature, Cougar 11.6 compared to 55% of the state average. John Harris 11.8 compared to the 55%. And again, SciTech insufficient sample, less than 20 students. So the, the, the data looks grim. It's never going to be good enough until 100% of our students are successful. That's the bottom line, the way every educator in Harrisburg feels. It's never going to be good enough. We expected a learning loss and we had it, 
But we did see some successes that I really wanted to highlight tonight because they're pretty big successes. Um, at the elementary level, every elementary school in Harrisburg exceeded the state average for English language development as measured in access. So access testing is done with our L students in January to about March. Um, our, I, what I'm gonna do is show you the data. So the state average was 24.8% of L students in the state were um, proficient or advanced. In Harrisburg, Ben Franklin students, 37.5, Downey, 32.4, Foose, 31.7, Melrose, 32.8, and Scott, 25.8. Many of you might ask why, and I, I, number one, want to say that our teachers did an amazing job keeping connected to students during remote learning. Our L teachers were passionate about making sure our kids were on and that kids came in to take the assessments. They made sure that L families had everything they needed. I also need to give kudos to our K-4 teachers because their literacy instruction aided students, L students, in performing well on the access. So congratulations to all of you for that hard work. Thank you. So some of the barriers for the school district that the school district faces in regards to student learning data in 21-22 is that COVID-19 rages on, it's, it's continued. We've had to go remote for short periods of time. We've had lots of absenteeism of both students and faculty. We've had learning loss and we're still um, trying to get a handle on the deficit skills that we have to make up for our students. Our students came back, some, some after a year and a half of staying home, we see some much more emotional deregulation in children than we said, than we saw before COVID-19. Mental health and trauma was present before, but it's present much more this year. Human capital crisis of bus drivers, support staff and teachers also riddle our school district and make it very difficult to make sure that the continuity of education is occurring in every single school for every single student. So you might ask how we are keeping a finger on the pulse of how students are doing throughout this year. And I think it's important to note that. Um, we administer a variety of assessments throughout the school year to see how our students are progressing through their instruction as they're in the instructional year. Just to give you an update, we, I'm gonna give you the beginning of the year screening data compared to the middle of the year screening data for our K-8 students. And what we see that we're really happy to see is we see growth. We see growth from the moments that students came back into school to the January date. In very few cases, students stayed around the same from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. In most cases, we see growth. That is what we're focused on. That is the um, growth in ELA. And the same is true of mathematics, that we see growth. It's incremental growth, but we're going to take growth for growth because our students are working hard at it. Our teachers are working hard at it. Is it enough? No, it's not enough students are proficient. We're continuing to work on this. I wanted to show you another tool that we are using this school year to really get a handle on the growth of our students and the achievement of our students. So what you see up here is a quadrant graph. And this is, um, this is the representation of one of our elementary classrooms. And each of those dots represent one student in that classroom. So there are 21 students in this classroom. The vertical line in the middle is the year for a year growth line. The horizontal line is the 40th percentile or what we would call proficient. What we want to see are students in that top what right quadrant, high growth, high proficiency. And this is a quite a successful classroom that where the majority of students are growing definitely a year for a year. And in our case, which is so important, we need to accelerate the growth so that students are growing more than a year for a year. Um, not all of them are achieving, 
beyond that 40th percentile, but this teacher is having a great deal of success. This is the kind of tool that we are using this school year, not only to, um, to keep a finger on the pulse of how students are doing, but to also group students according to their needs. If you can picture this, the top right quadrant would be two groups of students for small group instruction. The bottom right quadrant would be another group of students for small group instruction. And then those three little guys on the left, we gotta do something a little bit different and more intensive with those students. That's the kind of data that we are collecting and using in our PLCs to guide our instruction this school year. Some of our continued strategies for growth and improvement, targeted instruction based on student need, co-teaching, data-driven decision-making, ongoing progress monitoring uh, and intervention, student attendance improvement plans, school-wide positive behavior support plans, extended learning opportunities, mental health supports, and partners. That includes, this is not an exhausted list, but BAR, ESS, PA counseling, DEVRO, and communities and schools. So um, I want to thank you. I think that we have many people to thank um, for supporting us through what I would call the most challenging couple of years in my career. I know that many of my colleagues would say the same. Um, I, I give so much credit to our students, to the educators, our colleagues that we work with, to the parents and families in Harrisburg, but also to our community partners in Harrisburg who have continuously reached out continuously asked how they can help. And we're going to just keep pushing forward and persevere and our kids are going to see success. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sneath. Uh, just a, a couple of notes. Uh, you know, the one thing in terms of uh, looking at data across the country, um, every school, uh, when you started looking at data across the Commonwealth, uh, definitely had a significant loss. Uh, when you definitely look at the schools who were remote the entire year, um, that loss was that much greater. Um, so I've talked to colleagues in other districts who were remote for almost a year and a half, and those students suffered the greatest loss in terms of looking at test scores from the time they left school till, till the present. So um, I just do wanna thank uh, everyone, the curriculum team, all the teachers, staff, uh, who've done a phenomenal job to get through a tough school year, um, to really put our best foot forward and to really do the best we can to educate our students in Harrisburg. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Terman and Dr. Sneed for your presentation. At this time, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment? Um, we have three public comments for tonight. Um, first, I'll read guidelines for public comment. The receiver will follow board policy 903 during the public meeting. Public comment is limited to residents and taxpayers of this district or anyone representing a group in a community or school district. Any representative of a firm eligible to bid on materials or services solicited by the board, any district employee or any district student. A submission of a comment slip certifies that the speaker is a resident or taxpayer of this district, anyone representing a group in the community or school district, any representative of a firm eligible to bid on materials or services solicited by the board, any district employee or any district student. Each public comment by a participant shall be limited to three minutes duration and must be done in person. Copies of comment slips and policy 903 are on the, on the table in the back of the boardroom. The slip must be properly completed and submitted to the board secretary before the meeting is called to order by the receiver. Policy 903 requires that all public comments be made at the beginning of each meeting. If the receiver determines there is not sufficient time at a meeting for public comments, the comment period may be deferred to the next regular meeting or to a special meeting occurring before the next regular meeting. Our first one, Ms. Michelle Rocco, AGA President, 707 Veronica Lane, Enola, PA, 17025. She'll be talking about 6C resignation. 
Ms. Rocco. Good evening. As I look at the resignations uh, over the last couple of board meetings, um, it really saddens me that we see so many and it kind of makes me think, well, why is this occurring? Um, we already have a human capital deficit. There's many people in this room that I've talked with that have come to me and said, hey, you know, this, this year is really challenging and I'm not sure exactly if I'm gonna be able to make it through the year. And I'm looking at these resignations and I'm thinking, well, yeah, I understand, I, I get it. We've had so much violence in our schools that are causing teachers to have secondary trauma. Every day, somebody's getting injured. Every day, there's a fight. There's a lack of respect for adults. They're getting threatened. Our test scores are down because we don't have enough staff to be able to teach the class. There's lack of, con lack of consequences that are felt in schools. So people are not being supported and they really need to be. We've had teachers being assaulted. I was assaulted already at least twice this year. We've had broken bones. People have been pushed, knocked down on the floor, trying to break up fights. We don't have any support from the police. That's very sad. The secondhand trauma is really affecting our, our, our kids, our teachers, when our other students that we have, that we know are ready to do the right thing, and they're seeing all of this. I mean, I've had a student come and say to me, Ms. Rocco, we're not gonna have enough teachers because y'all are leaving. I said, yes, that's, that's a possibility. We've all had experience some form of the secondary trauma in some way, shape or form. This is affecting our mental health, our physical health and our socio-emotional health. Everybody, our principals, same thing. These are the reasons why teachers are leaving our district. And they're not just leaving the district, but they're leaving the profession, which means it worries me, where are we gonna be by next school year? I've always said that you can't build a house on a cracked foundation, but we're the foundation and we're crumbling. And if we don't do something now to fix what we feel is broken, we fix the trauma, whether it's student trauma, teacher trauma, then this district is going to implode. And we're gonna continue with the resignations where we won't have teachers to teach our kids. And they're the ones that are most important. But in order for that to happen, we, we need to feel like we are supported, like we matter, like we mean something. And that's, that's where, my, that's where everybody feels at this time. We need to do something to work and make sure that we are all healthy because our teachers are not, our principals are not, our administrators are not, our support staff are not. So we need to work together and we need to do it and we need to do it fast. Or otherwise we're gonna be in a big jam come August. Thank you, Ms. Rocco. Next, we have Ms. Jody Barksdale, 4512 Cro Crooked Hill Road, Harrisburg, PA, 17110-6A. Um, Good evening. Um, I'm just going to follow up on the Rowan schedule. Um, I've been a teacher in the Harrisburg School District for 23 years. I've only taught in Harrisburg, have no desire to leave. I've had offers, and I've turned them down. Healthy offers, where I would have made $18,000 a year, more than I currently make. I'm not leaving, I'm dedicated. However, we had to change our schedule at Rowan and change the way we do things because of the teachers that are leaving. And they're leaving because we can't protect our kids. I've seen a child get jumped by 10 kids and be knocked unconscious. I had to walkie and beg for someone to call 911. And very little consequences are happening, which I understand that some of your hands are tied because of state regulations or whatever, but I beg the community to please come and support the teachers. We need, Brian, I'm begging you to get with the community. They need to come and volunteer, get whatever clearances they need. 
help us monitor the hallways so the gangs our rivalries are not coming into our school buildings because that's what we're seeing at Roland. It's gang on gang violence. And we, I'm not capable of doing it. I, the district won't give me safe crisis management, management training, even though I've had it from previous years when I taught alternative ed. But we need that to be able to keep our kids safe and not just our kids, but ourselves. Because I can't in good conscience stand there and watch a kid get bludgeoned to the point where the sneaker print is imprinted on the child's face because that's what I'm seeing. We are literally seeing other children beating other children to the point of unconsciousness and the fact that I can identify what sneaker the child was wearing on another child's face. So I'm begging the community, the board, whoever can help us, please, please help us. Because when I can't keep my kids safe at Roland, that's the day that I feel like I can't do my job anymore. And I'm begging you, please support us. Thank you, Ms. Barksdale. Next, we have Karen Kipp, 4653 Fritchie Street, Harrisburg, PA, 17109, Student Services, Student ex Expulsion. Hi everybody, my name is Karen Kipp. I am a teacher at John Harris High School. Um, I just wanted to give you a snippet in about a half an hour of my teaching life on a day, uh, actually March 1st um, of this year, 1232 p.m. I will never forget it. This is a moment in my teaching career and I've been teaching for almost 24 years that I will never ever forget. Um, I was in the hallway waiting for another teacher, just standing there. No one was in the hallways. It was actually a, a, a very clear hallway, as we would say. And I'm standing there and suddenly I hear the screech of sneakers and I hear like, like yelling and I knew there was conflict coming around the corner. And I thought, oh God, gosh, you know what's coming up now? And suddenly, now they're about 30 feet away. Suddenly I see three kids coming around the corner, two girls on top of one boy. And as they were coming around the corner, these two girls pushed him towards the concrete wall, um, the exterior concrete, the interior concrete, concrete wall, missed the wall. But what had happened was his head slammed on the floor to the point why well, heard the crack? And that is something I don't think anyone ever wants to hear, parent or not. I ran over as fast as I could, and I also saw his head bounce off that floor. As I'm running to try to save him, these girls got on top of his chest with their knees, and they pummeled him with closed fists. As much as I could count, and I'm being... I am being probably reserved with this number 12 to 16 times. It was nothing short of assault, nothing short of assault. I got over there and a couple of girls, the two girls knew me. So I was able to verbally deescalate them pretty quickly. There we talk about having those bonds with students. I had bonds with those students and the kid, the boy, he jumped up and he ran away, which I was thankful for, because they would continue to pummel him. They, the girls walked away, they rationalized why, they, why he deserved it, because he, he took their phone. He gave it back, but he took their phone. And I just stood there and went, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And they all walked away like nothing ever happened. So I thought for sure, the next day, these girls would get suspended. I thought for sure. I thought for sure I would be interviewed. Never happened. They never were suspended because they were, it was taken as if they were horse playing. Um, the, the cameras, you know, their cameras are right there. 
And I thought, this is a case where these girls should have been suspended, and they weren't. As a parent, if you can imagine stepping back and feeling helpless because you can't keep the student safe. And I thought, for that moment, I thought, I'm here to keep my students safe. I'm here to keep any student safe. And I couldn't keep him safe. Thank you, Ms. Kibb. You're welcome. Thank you. Although public comment is not question and answer, out of respect for our teaching staff that is here, I will say on behalf of the board and administration, we see you, we hear you, and we are going to have some discussions with the administration because violence of any kind should not be tolerated in the school setting. And with that, uh, that concludes public comment. We are ready to move on to the new business items for receiver approval. We'll begin with the Office of Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Susky. The first uh, agenda item I have under the Office of the Superintendent is the schedule mod modification for Roland Academy. Per Board Policy 804, pre-approval from the PA Department of Education, it is recommended to ratify the change in the Roland Academy school schedule, effective March 7th, 2022, through the remainder of the 2021 slash 2022 school year due to significant staff shortages. The modification to the rolling schedule is approved as presented. Thank you, Dr. Susky. The next category, the Office of Human Resources, and that will be done by Mrs. Lori Lillis. Under items, we now? Green lights on, so. Okay, this, really this one works. All right, good evening, everyone. Under item 6.2 of human resources uh, for this evening, we um, a request in the approval of item A, approved job descriptions, um, Dr. Susky. The job descriptions are approved as presented. Under item B, we have three retirements. Number one being Ms. Anderson sitting at the uh, head table. Congratulations on your impending retirement, um, as well as uh, colleagues, uh, Susan Gibson and Eric Samuelson. Before I grant approval, I would just like to publicly acknowledge Ms. Christine Anderson for her many years of service to the Harrisburg School District. And we will have formal recog recognitions of all of our retirees uh, at the end of the year, but I just wanted to mention that since she's at the table this night, and those retirements are approved as presented. Thank you. Under item C, resignations end of service, there are 20 individuals listed there. Thank you. The 20 individuals listed on the agenda are approved for resignation or end of service with their effective dates listed. Thank you. We do fortunately have 10 new staff members joining us in the near future, and they are listed under item D. Thank you. The new staff listed in items one through 10 are approved as presented on the agenda with the start dates and the amounts listed. Thank you. Item E, change of status, and there are 12 staff members changing status within the district. Thank you. The change of status for the 12 individuals listed on the agenda is approved as presented. Under item F, column movements, we have uh, three individuals, uh, um, achieving uh, credits to move them to the next column of the salary schedule. Congratulations to those individuals and their column movement is approved as presented. Under item G under the supplementals and stipends, we have eight uh, members um, falling within the category. The supplemental stipends listed under item G one through eight are approved as presented. Thank you. Under item H, our spring sports, baseball, softball, and track coaches are listed below. Thank you. The supplemental stipends listed for the spring sports individuals in letter H are approved as presented. 
Thank you, letter I, enrichment programs, and there are a few listed there under letter I. The enrichment program funded through the Refugee School Impact Grant, those individuals are approved, as are the after school intervention program from March 7th to April 22nd, listed with the rate of pay of $31 per hour at Foo School, and the professional staff listed in numbers one through 23, I believe, are approved as presented. Item J, family medical leave of absence uh, for individuals listed there. Approved as okay. presented. And item K, one medical sabbatical. Approved as presented. Under item L, general human resources items, there are three items um, for your approval there. Item one, the ratification of the Kelly Education Agreement is uh, ratified as presented there with our substitute pay increases as presented. And we are very hopeful that that additional uh, increase is going to bring some additional substitutes to the school district. And we also ratify the extension of the agreement between the district and Gallagher Benefit Services as listed. And lastly, the HEA and district MOU for the adjusted work schedule for Roland is also approved as presented. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. At this time, we will turn to the Office of Business Services, and that will be presented by Dr. Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Terman. Dr. Susky, we have a variety of items listed under the Office of Business Services for your approval. First one being item A, which is the approval of the treasurer's report. This is for the period ending February 28, 2022, reflects a general fund bank balance of 51 million. $250,231.13. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. The treasurer's report is approved as presented. Thank you. Item B represents budget transfers made this school year in the amount of $1,859,813, with the majority of this being related to grants, especially our SR2 grant. The budget transfer is approved as presented. Thank you. Item C is ratifications of accounts payroll checks or accounts payable checks. These are checks and wire transfers uh, made, and those are rec uh, outlined in items one through nine. Thank you. I ratify numbers one through nine under letter C for accounts payable checks. It's approved. Thank you. Item D is ratification of our payroll processing for our two payrolls that occurred in March of 2022. Thank you, ratified for approval as presented. Item E represents seven facility use requests. These are in accordance to board policy 707. And before I approve, I would just draw uh, the public's attention to number seven. Uh, the community individual, Lavette Henderson, has requested the use of the John Harris Auditorium to address the issue of violence prevention, both in our schools and in our communities. And we have approved the use of our auditorium in hopes of bringing lots of parents and students and teachers to that event. So please mark your calendar for April 27th from 6 to 8 o'clock p.m. That group of seven facility use requests is approved as presented. Thank you. Item F represents fundraiser requests uh, from seven different groups for seven different fundraisers. The seven fundraisers listed on the agenda are approved as presented. Thank you. Item G is the approval of the capital area intermediate units operating budget for the 22-23 school year. This actually rep represents a decrease of just over $300,000. Harrisburg's contribution is $38,638.64, representing a 0% increase. The uh, capital area intermediate unit operating budget for 22-23 is approved as presented. Thank you. Item H, it represents an agreement of engagement between Boyer and Ritter and the school district to assist with accounting functions within the business office due to multiple vacancies. And this is subject to final solicitor and administrative review. Approved as presented. Thank you. And item I is a recommendation for the approval of repository bids 
They are uh, different properties represented within the Harrisburg School District. Thank you. The repository bids are approved as presented on the agenda and they are attached as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snokes. It's Dr. Stokes. Uh, next, we will go to the Office of Academics and that will be presented by Dr. Susan Sneak. Good evening. Um, under A, affiliation agreements, I'm requesting the approval for an affiliation agreement between Harrisburg School District and Lozers Music for ongoing instru instrument repair. At this time, we are requesting open per an open purchase order from March 22, 2022 through June 30, 2022 to determine if this service meets the needs of the school district. The affiliation agreement with Lozers Music is approved as presented. Thank you. Under B, professional development, um, first I'd like to ask for the ratification uh, for approval for Ms. Lorraine Myers to attend the 2022 PA Virtual uh, Migrant Education Program Conference. She did attend from March 15th to the 17th. This is at no cost to the school district. I ratify that approval as presented. Thank you. Um, items two through four are all upcoming PDs. Uh, the number two is for Ms. Angela Rodriguez to participate and, and Ms. Michelle Felton to participate and present at the PA Federal Programs Conference from April 3rd till April 5th in Pittsburgh, PA. This is in the amount of 882.55 funded through Title I. Approved as presented. I'm requesting uh, number three, Ms. Monica Reinigal to participate in the Pennsylvania School Library Association Conference from April 21 through 23 in Hershey, PA in the amount of $260. This will be funded through the general fund. Approved as presented. And lastly, request approval for Ms. Anita Snyder to attend the Pennsylvania Music Education Association Conference from April 7th to April 8th. The cost of the conference is $180 and will be funded through the general fund. Approved as presented. Thank you. There are no special education requests this month. D, student services. Um, please note that there are two um, requests for ratification of two students for expulsion. Student expulsion number 21-22007. I am ratifying approval of that. And student expulsion number 21-22008, I am approving that expulsion. Uh, both of those have been presented to me for review and both are approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. E, learning resources. Um, this one's important. It's an amendment from the February 22-22 business meeting. Just for clarification, there was an error I am requesting approval for a multi-year plan with Ed Insight on hand, which is our data management system for the 22-23 school year at $48,866.75 for the 23-24 school year at, for in the, at the rate of $50,821.42 and for the 24-25 school year in the amount of $52,854.28. This is a multi-year contract. By doing so, it saves the district $12,200.15. This is funded through the general fund. Thank you, Dr. Sneed. That amendment uh, to the motion that had been approved last month is now approved with the amounts listed below on this agenda. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting approval for an extension with the HVLA contract for additional elementary students from the first semester of the 21-22 school year in the amount of $80,070. This will be funded through ESSER. And I approve of the extension of the HVLA contract. Uh, we realize that we have many students in charter cyber schools. So having these students remain in-house in our own HVLA is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Under F for field trips, request approval to ratify permission for the NJ ROTC field trip for Harrisburg School District to participate in the color guard competitions that took place in Rancocas Valley Regional High School in Mount Holly, New Jersey. This occurred on 
Saturday, March 19th. This was funded through the general fund. I ratify the approval uh, for the trip that took place this weekend. Thank you. And request um, approval for the color guard to also go back to New Jersey this Saturday um, for an additional color guard competition. Approved as listed on the agenda. And lastly, request approval for permission for a field trip to the circus for 18 middle school special education students on March 25th, 2022. This is at no cost to the district. I approve as presented on the agenda. Thank you. And very last, G, um, I'd like to present the, the first draft of the 2022-2023 district calendar for approval. Would you like me to go over some of the highlights? Yes, if you could highlight uh, for the board and sure. the public, just a few of the changes perhaps. Uh, the, the, the district calendar is pretty similar to the way it's been for the past several years. However, there are two major changes. One of the changes is in that lime green. And what those are, are those are two hour delay or late arrival days for students so that we can have ongoing professional development with our colleagues once a month, for the most part, seven times during the school year. The second major change is with the professional development day in February and March. In the past, Harrisburg School District provides spring conferences in February, in the month of February. What we're finding is that the month of February is not very good timing for conferences for high school students. So what we propose in the contract is on February, I can't see the numbers, but February something, 18th-ish? Uh, 17th, thank you. Thank you, Adam. On February 17th, this will be a day off of school for students. This will be conferences for our K-8 families and our high school staff will have an Act 80 PD day. And then in March, on March 24th, we will host high school parent-teacher conferences and K-8 will have an Act 80 PD day. That's the major changes for the, for the calendar. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. 189 um, teacher days, 180 instructional days for students. And just to clarify for the board that HEA did have an opportunity to vet this draft of the calendar, correct? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the 2022-23 district calendar is approved as presented on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sneath. Next, we will move to Mr. Craig Glass in the Office of Operations. Thank you, Mr. Terman. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Susky. Um, I have several items for you this evening. Um, under item A, technology, number one, recommend ratification of a PEPM purchase with Dell Technologies Incorporated of 200 Chromebooks for K through eight students. Total cost, $60,406. Funding source, Title I. Item number two, recommend ratification of a purchase with Vertiv Corporation for the replacement of Portery.
BPH or DECA, uh, yeah, DECA firm, sorry. Um, and that rate is uh, $2 per DECA firm, and rate DS is negative 20 cents per DECA firm. Thank you, Mr. Glass. I approve the contract for Energy and Solutions and Response Program. I also execute contracts for natural gas basis pricing, pricing uh, energy as listed on the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Next, we will go to policy recommendations. We have one that will be presented by Mrs. Lewis. Yeah, uh, this evening uh, we have an update uh, recommendation policy 906 government complaint procedures. Uh, there are two changes to this policy. One uh, links uh, the actual policy to the PPP website. And the second change is the time to period, the final time period to be received the resolution of the complaint shall not exceed 45 days. That's it. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. I approve of the policy revision to 906 as indicated by Ms. Lewis. And after approval, that policy will go to the active file in your docs on the district website. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. Next, we will have our community reports. Uh, Mrs. Johnson is not here this evening, so we will go to number two. Uh, Dolphin County Technical School Joint Operating Committee. Uh, and that will, the person speaking to that would be Mr. Stephen Williams. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, with the uh, at the most recent Dolphin County Technical School Board meeting, uh, it was lifted up that the admissions policy that the school has in writing has not been adhered to appropriately. And a proposal to change it was um, proposed <laughs> uh, during that meeting. However, it was met with a lot of pushback by some of the folks that were on the board. Uh, so a committee was uh, put together to oversee the admissions, po admissions policy being revised so that uh, the number of students from the ascending school districts uh, get a fair shake and an equitable shake at attending the technical school. Now, I am on that committee. Uh, the date that they hope to have the uh, revised proposal implemented is May of this year so that it can be effective for the following school year. What we are focused on and what you know we're trying to make sure is happening is that the number of students from Harrisburg uh, is proportionate at least to the number of students that attend the Harrisburg School District. Uh, currently, there is no set quota for the number of students to attend, and we're trying to make sure that the students in Harrisburg can attend you know, according to uh, size of the school district. So that's what we're working towards. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. The next report will be the Pennsylvania School Boards Association by Mr. Jim Thompson. Thank you, sir. Uh, the first item from the PSA is the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. The SBA published an article in the last month uh, cautioning against misinterpretation of the 2021 state assessments. I was very happy to see the, uh, an excellent explanation on the part of Dr. Steve tonight as our school district, uh, rather than relying on the statewide test scores, that uh, we've been more proactive about doing local testing and tailoring. Uh, the educational services. In that regard, uh, we look ahead to uh, April 25th is Advocacy Day. And uh, one of the things that PSBA does is they look statewide in the aggregate and say, well, you know, we've had learning loss statewide. But I think for Harrisburg, is we want our representatives to go to our state legislature and uh, be able to, to use the uh, data uh, that we see internally uh, to point out that our learning loss is much higher than what we see on the state averages. So uh, we don't wanna just uh, echo the message of PSBA, but we wanna work our board members who are planning to attend 
advocacy day and talk to our legislators, we all want to be speaking from the same uh, list of priorities as a school district. So, to that regard, I know that uh, Ms. Robinson and I are both made a commitment to attend advocacy day and we'd like to meet with the uh, administrative team and the receiver to make sure that we're all on message with the right facts and figures in place so that we can uh, advocate for the kind of funding uh, that uh, we try to get share a funding formula through the day. Uh, advocacy day is one of the days when we can do that. That is April 25th. I encourage other board members to register for Advocacy Day. You do it through my PSBA site and we'll go as a group. Uh, aside from that, is, um, we have um, also PSBA offers professional development type seminars. They are offered virtually. And again, register for these online uh, at the end of March on the 29th and 31st, there are evening, it's about an hour and a half uh, seminar on the relationship of the school district to county health. And then on the 31st is an explanation of ESSER funds. Great opportunity for board members to uh, broaden your understanding of application of things like the ESSER funds that apply to the public school district. On April 4th, the issue will be uh, labor issues and trends with John Callahan, uh, is the, um, a lawyer with the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. And finally, on April 6th, in the evening for an hour and a half, is a seminar on state and federal budgeting. So I would encourage uh, my fellow board members to take advantage of these. They are offered at no cost and uh, it's really a, a good opportunity to jumpstart your um, knowledge and participate. There are always discussions during these. In addition to that, uh, I have registered for uh, the all directors monthly exchange. Again, I know Ms. Uh, Ms. Robinson participates in these commonly. Uh, the next one is a one hour uh, director exchange. It's an opportunity to meet school directors from other school districts uh, in a uh, virtual format at 1230 on April 19th, May 17th, and June 21st. Sign up in the same place. You register for these right on the My PSBA website. Um, you know, in a situation where uh, one of our priorities as a board is to uh, develop ourselves professionally so that when the time comes for this board to receive local control, that we're knowledgeable and uh, ready. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And last, we will have the Act 141 Advisory Committee. Uh, that will be chaired, that is chaired by Mr. Doug Thompson Leader. Um, uh, this meeting, like many of the prior reports I've made with the advisory council. Uh, we get together, we get a lot of the same information that was provided here by the superintendent, a superintendent's update, but we actually then begin to focus on aligning the recovery plan with activities going on in the school with the dynamic other issues that the school district is facing. And this particular month, we did look at some of the same data that was presented here and how those tools are actually utilized down into the classroom so that teachers can be much more responsive to what our students' performance actually is, as opposed to some of the other testing scores that are out there that are obviously not 100% participation, so that's an issue. But the data that we have in-house, the teachers are utilizing, it's really phenomenal. We got a lot more deeper into it because we were actually able to ask a lot more questions, but I was very impressed with that. Um, I'm a big advocate for the recovery plan, having a dashboard that is coming along and going to be refined as we move forward. Some of the other issues that we're dealing with because of COVID have exacerbated 
stuff that we were already ready to address in the recovery plan. And those are the kind of discussions that we had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson leader. And next we will roll into the superintendent's report. We have a couple of things this evening. First, we'll be remembering Mrs. Ruth Hicks Naylor. Mrs. Ruth Hicks Naylor passed away on March 9th, 2022. She served the Harrisburg School District as a passionate and dedicated elementary school teacher at Boos Elementary School, where she retired. The Hicks family has a legacy of service to our district that their son, Mr. Will, Will Hicks, proudly carries on for our students, families, and staff as the principal of Foos Elementary School. At this time, if we can bow our heads for a moment of silence. Thank you. Next, we will discuss very quickly the mask policy update. Um, based on the latest guidance from the CDC and two consecutive weeks of COVID-19 cases counts in the Dolphin County area being low, masks are encouraged but not required in the Harrisburg School District. This change applies to all of our schools, buildings, and school buses. The district's masking policy does not change the, the face mask requirement for the capital area transit bus riders. The new mask policy went into effect on March 16th, 2022. All other information is available on the district website. And the last, uh, last note I have for this evening is save the date for in-person kindergarten registration events at six community locations. To help families prepare for the upcoming school year, the Harrisburg School District will host March into Kindergarten events at six convenient locations, offering in-person kindergarten registration, translation support, information about learning options, educational resources, fun activity for kids, free snacks, and more. At this time, we will play a very quick video uh, to highlight the event. The Harrisburg School District is pleased to present March into Kindergarten, a series of free family fun events for families with children who will attend kindergarten in the upcoming school year. During these events, parents and guardians can complete on-site, in-person kindergarten registrations while your children participate in fun-filled activities and more. Free snacks are available. Save the date and join us for one of these upcoming March into Kindergarten events. Monday, March 28th at Scott School from 4 to 6 p.m. Tuesday, March 29th at Downey School from 4 to 6 p.m. On Wednesday, March 30th at Ben Franklin from 4 to 6 p.m. Thursday, March 31st at Melrose School from 4 to 6 p.m. Friday, April 1st at Foose School from 4 to 6 p.m. On Saturday, April 2nd, all schools will be represented at the Lincoln Administration Building from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. Harrisburg School District's March into Kindergarten events are a great way to get connected in person with our superintendent, principals, teachers, district departments, and community partners who are dedicated to providing your child with an excellent education that encourages a love for learning. For information, call 717-703-4008 or visit the district website at www.hbgsd.us. Welcome to kindergarten. So I do want to highlight and thank Mrs. Keyes for putting this together. Uh, she's done a phenomenal job in working with the team and putting all this together to make sure we get our students registered for kindergarten as soon as possible. I will take this time to make sure I encourage parents 
to regist register their children early. Um, the sooner that students are registered for kindergarten, it does help us in terms of looking at class size and, and everything preparing for next school year. So I encourage you, please come to one of the, the, the uh, workshops so you can get a chance to get information about registering your child and we will be able to, to start to get our students registered for next school year. Thank you, Dr. Susky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before we adjourn, I would just like to thank the board for being here in person tonight. It is wonderful to see all of you here and to also see all of you here from the public. And one other announcement, the school board will be meeting on Saturday, March 26th from 9 a.m. until noon for a board professional development session. With that said, meeting adjourned.